Um, as we approach the end of this journey, a 3D conversation on how to create uh, new opportunities for dealers to reduce costs, increase efficiencies, uh, expand their market reach, perfect their market message, and then deliver an outstanding customer experience online or in the store. I brought up uh, some of my favorite folks who are in the lead and working very hard to provide the technology process and support for dealers who want a modern brand experience. I just want to remind everyone who registered for the conference, both the vendors and uh, the dealers and OEs, that I have a Dropbox link with all the keynote presentations. So um, you'll have them. If you want a uh, PowerPoint from a workshop, please reach out to the individual workshop leaders. They may or may not, you know, disclose their individual workshops. But anything on the main stage, I want uh, the community to be able to see. I know there's a lot of questions on David Netter's deck, uh, Chip Perry's deck, Cassie's deck had some amazing stats. So those will all be available. So the Dropbox is created, everything's synchronized. Perry will send out an email. Uh, over the next few days, once Connor catches up on his rest, he will slice up all the live stream videos for every keynote. So each keynote will be a standalone uh, video file, and everyone who's registered have uh, links to those videos, right? So if you've been featured in it, you want to use it in your own marketing, if you want to listen or share some of the concepts that were discussed here, we'll have all that together. And, of course, you have your USBs with the conference uh, book. Um, we're immediately after this panel, we're going to play five shopping experiences. We place five people in front of five different products, and we told them, go buy a car. And we'll watch their faces, we'll watch their keystrokes, and then we'll talk about it. We're going to have popcorn served because anytime you go to the movies, we should have popcorn, and that should be an awesome time. I just want to remind everyone who's been following the journey on digital retailing, uh, Jim Flint. Jim, are you here? Let's see, Jim. Jim said something really profound, uh, like he normally does, and he said, you know, Brian, this feels like the third wave. The first wave was websites and the Internet, and dealers were like, wow, this is overwhelming. we got to be on the internet highway, we got to put our business on the internet highway, and then we got over that fear, and then the second fear is mobile, uh, your websites look horrible on mobile, everyone's going to mobile, and people say, well, how am I going to build a mobile website, and then there was this whole, maybe two years of conferences that was nothing about mobile traffic, mobile trends, mobile this, mobile that, responsive websites, your website sucks, you know, uh, frame, you know. And now we're kind of over that, and, and Jim says, it feels like digital retailing is this third wave of kind of apprehension. I thought that was really, uh, really well put. And I've been interviewing all the leaders in digital retailing, so if you want to uh, check out those podcasts. Of course, we're going to have some fun. Um, we will not live stream the live testing of consumer videos, okay? So the live stream will stop after this panel. Uh, because those videos are just for us and our consumption uh, to learn from. Not that there's anything horrible about it, but it's the agreement I made with, you know, the people who said, yeah, go and put a consumer in front of our uh, technology. And then afterwards, we're going to have some more of the cherry pie pinot. Um, a number of people like the fire seed chardonnay last night. How many people like that chardonnay? Raise your hand. Okay, great. The three people over here. Good. There will be ample... <laughs> Ample Chardonnay for you. Um, and remember, there was three different Pinot Noirs from uh, Cherry Pie. And so uh, as you're testing, you could just ask the server whether it was the Stanley Ranch or the Higginbotham or whatever the other one uh, was. Uh, just to remind everyone, I, I've got a lot of really positive feedback. Terry and I work hard to put together great speakers and content. Uh, it's never perfect. We always try to raise the bar, but I want to thank everyone for the just the encouragement. Uh, some people who have never been here before said, man, I've been to so many conferences and listened to them all, but I love the content. I love the engagement. I love the honesty. Some people said, I really like the fact that people said that they failed and pivoted. I love the fact that people talked about numbers and profit and performance. 
And then, really, that this was one big conversation. Obviously, a big hit was the wine tasting competition. People say, please do that again next year. We definitely will uh, do that next year as well. Uh, but the fall conference, the Automotive Analytics and Attribution Summit, I just want to encourage the vendor community, if you want to be in an amazing conference setting talking about really marketing, analytics, attribution, and of course, digital retailing is a big part of that because um, I think attribution models are going to start moving more towards integrating the digital retailing results, So, which means we're going to start being able to talk about attribution to a sale much easier uh, once the digital retailing tools evolve. So let's jump into our panel. We'll start on this side. Uh, I would like you to introduce yourself, how long you've been in the automobile business, and uh, what you are laser focused on in, in digital retailing right now. Just a short little intro. Tim, let's start. Oh, turn on the mic. Turn on. Come on. It's all right. I know you're nervous. I, I know stop. You're nervous. Come on. Come on. You're good. My name is Tim Cox, and um, this marks my 30th year. <laughs> Before that, I was in Oxford. No, but uh, this is my 30th year. I uh, started as a 17-year-old punk kid in 1989. It's uh, 30 years in the automobile business. And uh, we're laser-focused on serving our dealers. We're laser-focused on, on, you know, making um, a process uh, wrap around their people, and then, therefore, it expands. So that's what we're laser-focused on, and helping them sell automobiles, which are the end game. Hi, my name is Ryan Austin. I'm Chief Operating Officer at Goobagoo. I've been in the industry not quite as long as Tim, but uh, seven years um, since, uh, since the beginning of Goobagoo, really. And, uh, you know, with, with digital retailing, we're really focused on enabling a modern um, retailing experience for, uh, for car buyers that's producing positive outcomes for not only the consumer, in, in a more convenient experience, uh, but also positive outcome for the dealer, so it's a win-win. Hi, I'm Kelly Mulroney. Um, I've been in the automotive industry uh, about five years, um, and uh, today I head up product and engineering for dealer track uh, as well as digital retailing. Um, before I came to automotive, I actually spent a long time really in direct-to-consumer commerce businesses, so I had kind of product and GM jobs at places like Patel.com, GameStop, and uh, uh, and at Travelocity.com. Hi, I'm Alexi Veneri. I'm co-founder and CEO of Digital Airstrike. Uh, I've been in the industry 19 or 20 years at this point, um, and I love it, so thank you. It's literally the best industry in the world, for sure. Um, what we're focused on, we originally started more on kind of the front end and monitoring listening to consumer sentiment, reviews, ratings, uh, serving consumers. And there was just so many things that we found that was broken in digital retailing. We're like, I'm tired of reading these bad reviews. <laughs> and these surveys, there has to be tools and technology that we can do it for the dealers. So um, help them with it. So we're kind of Switzerland. We um, are opportunistic in terms of where can we fill a gap or hole so those consumers have a better experience. Um, and it's just been fascinating to really work with so many amazing vendors and partners in this industry over the years, and certainly today, to just fill the gap that that one dealer needs at that moment. Um, one of our co-founders always said dealers are like snowflakes. You know, they kind of look alike from a distance. When you get in there, you guys all have your own needs. Um, so that's what we're focused on is how can we help that consumer journey and have those tools that are just going to make them have an excellent experience and our dealers make more money. My name's Andrew Gordon. Uh, my background, I'm a mechanical computer science engineer um, and a third generation Honda dealer. Um, so I guess I've been in the automotive industry since I was a kid, but I've uh, been inside the dealership uh, for the last 10 years or so. Um, dealer science was born out of our store. Um, we examined all the solutions that we saw out there. Um, and what we found was that they weren't really understanding how we worked as a dealership. Uh, they weren't understanding who we, who we were, how the um, the operations were working inside our store with um, how sales managers operate, how they interact with BDC. Um, we couldn't find what we needed. We built it. Um, so that's where dealer science was born from, and the solutions have grown from there by um, really being humble enough to listen to the dealer partners that we work with and taking their feedback and trying to build solutions that not only work for them, but work for the vast majority of dealers out there and their processes. 
Thanks. My name is Amit Chandarana. I'm the uh, SVP of Sales and Business Development at Roadster. Uh, technically, I've been in the industry about 15 years. Most of that was on the OEM side. Uh, but at Roadster, we're just laser focused on modernizing the business for buyers and sellers. So, panel, um, we've heard from people who've been experts at digital retailing for the last three or four months. Uh, one of the comments from the attendees was, you know, when you had panels and say, you know, they've been doing digital retailing, I was expecting them to say, we've been doing this for two years. And uh, it was actually refreshing for people here to hear, like, no, we're, we're relatively new in this. We're six months in, we're nine months in. That's how, how new it is. Um, I'd like to ask a, a slightly more difficult but transparent question. Uh, I'm going to start with Ahmed, and we'll work down. We've been talking about the evolution of digital retailing, but could you share something that's really recent, an observation that you or your team have learned in the last month or two about something maybe that you didn't think about, realize, or observe that has forced you to pivot, enhance, or do something differently? Because I want the people who are watching via live stream, everyone here, to be now looking for what, when we leave here, what's coming? What is the pivot that we're seeing right now? Um, what are you working with on integration that you think is the next big thing? Just something that we're looking forward, not backwards. We'll start with a minute. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that it's a pivot per se. Um, I think for us, and I think most of the partners up here, that the humility of knowing that you have to constantly iterate this product, right? Um, the day that any of us say that we've got it figured out, we're wrong and we're done, we close up shop. Um, we have 600 dealer partners. We used, to, we used to sell cars directly, and we called it our test kitchen in our laboratory before dealers bought the technology from us. We have 600 people yelling at us every single day about what we screwed up today. Um, so we're constantly iterating the product. I think the biggest thing that's come into play is uh, most of the dealers are now getting to a point where they want to see speed enhanced, they want to see integrations enhanced, uh, and they want to see all of us play nice in the sandbox even more. So. Back in the day, it was Roadster, hey, get this done for us. Roadster, hey, get this done for us. Now it's said publicly traded automotive group. Let me call the partner and help you get this done uh, so that we can all get this modernized the industry and satisfy the customer level users. So small little nuggets that have changed in the product, like reserving a vehicle or accepting deposits or things of that nature, are constantly evolving. But it's really the integration that's coming forth with all of the partners in the room is, is the thing that I've seen the most probably over the last couple months. Great. Andrew, you built a product. You've moved it now into other dealerships as you've now exposed and been vulnerable that your idea may not have been perfectly fit for everyone else. What are some new things that you're learning that is making dealer science better? Yeah, I think um, what we're learning from dealers is that 80% um, of their processes are very similar. 10% um, are a little bit different, and then 10% are wildly different. Um, so what we're learning is that um, when we come in, we don't want to come in with a heavy hand and tell them, here's how you're going to go sell cars. Um, what we want to do is learn from them, what are your processes inside your store? How do you interact with your customers? How can we make that less work? Um, and one of the important things about doing that is making sure that you have the best data, uh, making sure that you can capture everything just like a sales manager would. Um, I was having a conversation this morning uh, with, with Bob. I don't know if he's, he's over here at university. Um, but we were going through some of the ways that his team gets deals um, and how they go from lease to finance and adjust for rebates and um, even things like outside financing sources. And at the end, what he said was like, if my other – if my desk managers can do this better than the tool, then they're not going to use it. Well, that's why it's a desking tool from the start. That's why it captures everything. So I think that's really that's really the difference. Um, so I think that's the that's the big thing that we're learning is capturing those nuances and all the data. Lexi, uh, Digital Airstrike has been acquiring companies to give dealers a portfolio of solutions. Out of all the things that you've been working on, what's something relatively new that one of your products is solving or you're pivoting to improve the product to serve some of the gaps you talked about? Sure. Um, one of our newest acquisitions is a company called Libre Systems, and I think what's really interesting about what we do um, is we've been either co-founded or buying companies founded by dealers because they were solving a problem. Um, and literally, even starting Digital Airstrike, you know, I was super fortunate to work with Cassie over there at Van Tile, and 
it was, you know, it was at a conference like this, God, it's good. <laughs> but it was like, what is the problem dealers aren't getting? And it was always, what can we do for them to automate? And it was social media at the time. Now, that was almost 10 years ago, but it's because I was talking to those dealers and, and listening. And we really tried to stay true to that. And what Leap does um, is, you know, for a lot of years, I love dealer track. I have CMO there. We'll have to share notes. But we had payment driver. We still do. And it sounds great. You know, someone wants to calculate a payment, and it's in our quote. I had no honest idea how much subprime business is out there. You know, and it's because I don't think dealers talk about it that much. It's payment. It's pain. It's hairy. It's all of those things. But as interest rates go up, as, you know, we've been a little bit fat and happy in our economy, right? So people are buying more houses, and they're getting more credit card debt, and suddenly it's going to be a bigger part of the business. And I, even having been at dealer track, I didn't know how hard that was. And then it became a pain point when we went back to the data. I've also heard always look at the data. It tells you what you need to know about your dealership. And that's where we're getting the negative reviews and surveys. Like, you told me I get in for, you know, a four ninety nine a month payment. It wasn't the fault of that dealer or that person. It was the tools or the misperception that this industry was put out there. So that's a new thing that we're seeing. How can we kind of solve a problem that maybe dealers didn't even really know was such a problem, such as, do you know how many deals you're closing based on credit score? I mean, all my years, I never thought to ask that. So it's interesting, and that's new for us. We don't yet have a report or a way to, like, show that to dealers, but that's something new that we've learned. And as, again, we're just listening to our dealers and uh, sometimes playing with companies. So. <laughs> well, you know, uh, just to uh, piggyback, and we'll go to Kelly in a second, uh, on the Nissan tour, uh, there are a number of, of dealers who are visiting, and when we talk to them, they're like, yeah, uh, sometimes a big part of our business. And one of the problems with um, the tool sets is – um, there's some extra hairy steps that, you know, go through. So if somebody gets rejected at a certain level, then they're going to go to this other company. How does the consumer who's uh, getting pre-approved online know that their credit's horrible? Do you tell them, hey, your credit's horrible, get the hell out of here or something, you know, or, or what's that flow? Uh, so that's great. So we're going to pick up on that, uh, Alexi. Um, Kelly, what new things or thoughts or directions – Cox has a huge opportunity across KBB, Auto Trader, the dealers.com website, VIN Solutions, right? Dealer Track, DMS. You have a huge opportunity. As you've been putting all these pieces together, what's something recent that's exciting you or is solving a problem that maybe you didn't realize you had? Yeah, so we've been really focused uh, in digital retailing on, on two things. One, uh, driving really strong uh, consumer engagement. Um, you know, when you think about digital retailing in the context of dealer.com or in the context of Auto Trader or KBB, that, that is a, an engagement tool in the context of a broader marketing program. Um, and we've actually gotten really nice results. We've, we've also seen that for those deals that start online, um, we get good closed rates, high profitability uh, once they get into the store. Um, but what we are really focused on now, and this is based on just the data that we look at as well as feedback, you know, from our clients is, um, number one, we're continuing to be relentlessly focused on online to store or on the channel. Uh, that's come up several times. You know, we've been working on that. Uh, last year, we're going to continue to work on that as we go forward. Uh, but really, the, the, the key piece that as we looked at, as we said, listen, we really want to not only engage consumers with digital retailing, but we actually want to make it really easy for them to, to do as much of that process online as possible. Uh, and that really comes with very carefully optimizing the user experience, making sure that the user experience is as, as engaging as possible. So we're really actually going back. You know, we, we think a lot about um, client needs, about omnichannel, about their marketing strategies, um, and that's all good stuff. Uh, but we're really turning now to the consumer experience and really focusing deeply on that consumer experience. Um, we're probably going to bring back, we had features that we kind of suppressed before, which we'll probably bring back as a lot of interest in um, dynamic communication between the store and the consumer online. Uh, it was an early feature in, a, in an early rendition of Make My Deal. We've, we've been at digital retailing now for a while. Um, and I think we're going to see more of that come back in. We've been integrating with, with chat tool providers. I think we have more to do there for sure. Ryan, what's uh, as WGU is been leaning in, gaining momentum, adding more dealers? What's something recently that you've learned 
uh, that's required a pivot, an enhancement, or just a new vision of what the future looks like? Sure. So, uh, you know, one thing that comes to mind uh, relates actually back to, uh, I think it was yesterday or the prior, uh, with the brand promise. And really, um, you know, each dealer is going to have a unique um, brand and set of values and outcome that they're trying to produce with digital retailing. So to give you a specific example, some dealers will care um, very strongly about the number of leads that they're producing from digital retailing. So they're going to want to have really strong uh, lead capture uh, built in with, say, a personal information form or PII form or what have you. There's other dealers who um, don't care so much about that. They're more about bringing a transparent uh, transparency to the process online, uh, and they think that um, that hinders uh, that experience that they're trying to to bring, and it's not aligned with their values and their brand promise that they're putting into the market. So that's one thing that we learned um, is having to be flexible uh, to, um, you know, uh, work the tool uh, according to the brand and values of the dealer and actually change features based on that so that it's aligned with the experience that's happening on the website and the experience that's happening on the store and what the dealer is putting in the market on, on, on TV and radio and all that, right? So it's not a one-size-fit-all uh, solution, but really something that needs to be aligned with the dealership's uh, values and strategy. Before we get to Tim, I just want to share a story. Your story reminded me the first time I saw a dealer sockets precise price. And I went through the demo, and I'm like, there's no lead form. And they're like, yeah, um, they can do the entire deal. And if they want to send their information to the dealer, they can. And I'm like, really? Like, this is the first time I didn't see this. Like, hey, you know, uh, customize your payments. And the first thing is like, okay, I need everything about your life. Um, I shared that story with a few dealers. I'm like, that's the stupidest thing ever. And I'm like, why is that the stupidest thing? It's like, your leads will go down. And, you know, I think there's going to be some debate. I don't think we have the answer now. That's why I think we need to have a standard for Google Analytics uh, to look at this visual sales funnel based on what questions you ask and when, what step goes here or there. Um, but we may find out in a few years from now that's exactly what should happen um, or when the consumer wants some help or is engaged. Uh, so very, very good, uh, you know, learning that dealers – are not approaching digital retailing with an open slate. They're coming with some pre-defined uh, prerequisites. Tim, in the last few months, as you've been expanding, congratulations on uh, announcement this week on the Mercedes program uh, for digital retailing. That's awesome. Uh, talk to me about a recent pivot or observation or the data is telling you something that this audience and our live streamers would want to know about. Well, like uh, Andrew, uh, I'm a car guy, and uh, before we started Car Now, I spent 18 years running dealerships, and our job is to sell cars. And uh, you've said it many times, you know, hey, you've crushed it, look at this, look at that, all the leads and all these things are important. At the end of the day, it's about selling automobiles with this particular tool. So we actually took a hard pivot, and we started listing to our dealers, um, two things. I think that every single company up here and representative, representative of that company uh, would understand that the breakdown with any tool that you're using is the disconnect from using the tool to walking into the dealership. That's the disconnect. Spend 20, 30 minutes, an hour, whatever it is, online playing with the tool. They show up at the dealership and, and people say, who are you? So we really doubled down, not necessarily with a tool function, although we do have a, a application to pick that up like some others do up here, but really driving process. That's why we have three times as many and growing trainers on the ground to really develop that process. But most importantly, as far as with the tool itself, is understanding that every single dealer in this room and every single dealer in the country is different. Therefore, they have different process, different, there was a gentleman up here that doesn't have a DDC, but yet, you know, we have stores that sell a thousand cars a month that have an amazing DDC. It doesn't work for him. It might, you know, so, yeah. so we have to be able to be nimble enough to serve our dealers. So what we did is we basically, um, most customers that go through the data says their own three to 4% are going through the entire process and putting in a deposit. 
So for dealers that don't want to go through the entire process, we just developed another uh, sublet of our digital retailing pool. We're calling it Price Now to where it's the calculator. It's the trade form. It's everything else. We're still receiving all that data. It's quick. It's simple. It's fast. But it's not the full blown like digital yeah. retailing light. Right. Exactly. And that we literally made that a couple because that's what the data says and that's what's selling cars. So therefore, customer or dealers dealers that are interested about digital retailing can put their toe in the water and as they get acclimated, as we go into the store and love on their people and train their people and as they, they can upgrade, work, they can absolutely you know, uh, Andrew Ty from Moto Insights, if you didn't pick that up, said that a number of times today on a panel, kind of like Pick your battle, pick your war, uh, you know, focus on getting one thing right. Uh, then you heard other people on the panel say you got to go all in. So, you know, maybe a top Caputo would say, you know, uh, DR Light is a half, you know, big commitment. I think there's no right or wrong answer. It depends on the culture. Uh, Kelly, since you've never been on one of my panels and we just met, I'm going to give you a hard question. Fair enough. Are you ready? You ready, I'm ready to go? Okay, so some people have even implied that it's so painful for digital retailing companies to work with CRMs. There's even conversations that, A, they're getting rid of the CRM because it's not working, or, B, the companies here on this uh, dais are feeling that, well, they have to build the CRM, enhance their DR dashboard because the, the VIN solutions of the world, the uh, e-leads of the world, uh, and name any other, the dealer sockets of the world, uh, they're outdated, they don't accept the rich data record, uh, they charge high fees for API access. There's a whole list of things. But this is the first conference I'm hearing people saying, I may give up my CRM. When you hear that, obviously their complaints are legitimate. What do you see as Cox Automotive with a, a very popular CRM and a very prevalent digital retailing tool? What, what kind of relief for people who are want to use VIN Solution CRM but not uh, accelerate digital retailing? What, what's the future look like? Is there any solution on the horizon? So um, there is, uh, and I, I think at some point we've got to evolve beyond ADF. Um, it, you know, it isn't. It isn't robust enough to support kind of this evolving marketplace. Um, so we have th – there's a couple parts, actually, to our, our digital retailing strategy at Cox. Um, there's certainly the part of our strategy that's extremely focused on a, a digital retailing experience, you know, built for consumers. Uh, that's a subscription product to dealers. Uh, there's another part of our strategy that's really very API-focused. Um, and, uh, and and we were sort of early in the market with, uh, you know, kind of payment calculations. We continue to evolve that kind of a product um, early in the market with, uh, you know, integration to, to credit apps. Um, the, the latest thing that we've been working on is, uh, is essentially a set of deal services um, that allow us now to, to take in a deal uh, in, a, in a richer format. Um, and we have those APIs in uh, sort of developer preview now. Uh, we have uh, one dealership who built their own proprietary CRM who's actually experimenting with it. Um, you were experimenting with, with VIN as well. It's always good to be able to kind of be, get, use your own folks as a good thing. Um, but I think overall, in general, our philosophy has always been, hey, let's, let's open this up and let's kind of enable the communication of, of data and information. Because at some point, it, you know, we, we want it to feed into whatever the customer system of record is for a dealer. Um, but then it'll flow from there to some other tool. Um, and that's the perfect use of, of having really great, you know, data APIs. So that's what we are working on. Um, you know, we don't have yet a GAD, but we're absolutely experimenting in, in, in beta and developer preview. Okay. Um, Amit, Roadster, uh, Todd Caputo talked about Roadster. One of the unique things uh, about Roadster is that it's, it's platform agnostic, okay? Car now, buy now is platform agnostic. Gubba Goose, a platform agnostic. Um, we have this conversation that we started this afternoon with what happens if every OEM picks two or three and it becomes this hodgepodge. How Ro Roadster took an approach where, hey, I'll wrap your whole website and you can still have an OEM compliant website. Um, do you see that as the future? for dealer groups, like, there's there's no, you know, and I know it sounds self-serving, but um, you took an approach. 
would a 50-store dealer group survive if they had six different digital retailing platforms? Is that is that is that a possible future or not? I mean, you you obviously took an approach. I see this as a train wreck coming up for dealer groups that want to create a brand promise in a local market. What, what's your feeling on this? Yeah, I mean, we, we've clearly taken a Swiss arms dealer approach in this, and, and Switzerland's won quite a bit, right? <laughs> so um, I think they can survive. Uh, whether or not they thrive is a different strategy, right? I mean, you, you have groups that have three, 400 dealers that do things in geographies that are run by different RVPs um, that might, might want to manage it that way, right? There are publicly traded groups, so there's large groups that say, hey, we're, we're really hands-off, we're letting our regions or our platforms or our market vice presidents manage things the way they want. I actually think that's a good thing. I think whether or not they use us or they use any one of our competitors or use some of the other ones out there, I think it's good to learn from all of those and they determine which technology actually works for them initially, and then which one's a better partner at the end of the day. Um, I think the OEMs certifying us as providers is all going to suss itself out in the end in the sense that there's, look, depending, I, I genuinely feel bad for dealerships at times because there's probably seven or eight digital retailing tools or retailing tools that do it well. There's probably 15 that do it, and there's probably 25 that say they do it. And I think we're getting to a point where the OEMs are basically trying to suss them out and say, let me take these 25, distill it down to 10, maybe take it down to 7 or 8, give you guys the optionality. And by the way, we're building ours at the same time. The most respected OEMs are saying, we're going to build our own. In the meantime, we're going to white label all of you guys out there, let you kind of figure out what the you know, cream rice to the top. Uh, and then ultimately, the ones that are good will survive and most importantly, will satisfy the needs of the dealer. Maybe it's saving time. Maybe it's cutting down the process minutia, um, or increasing the CSI, which is what most of us are trying to do. So I absolutely think it can survive. We encourage people to A/B test us all the time. Don't just use Roadster. Use another platform out there. Let's see how this works, and then you'll see what kind of partner you're developing with the company. Great, Brian. I want to go back to you because I had a great conversation with your uh, founder, Brad Title, and. He was very uh, excited about some of the recent data uh, that dealers who expected, and, and Tim, you mentioned this, the number of people who actually go through A to Z, the whole process online, was, you know, 3, 4, 5 percent. Um, but what he was so excited about was like, Brian, when, when you're developing metrics, you know, I'm, I'm trying to build... Google Analytics events and standards to create visual sales funnels that we can compare a Roadster to a Gubbagoo to a Buy Now to an Accelerate. And uh, he says, I hope, I hope the criteria isn't that the person who has, you know, you only get 5% and you got 8%, you're the winner. The real thing, which Tim said, was, are we selling more cars? So, so Ryan, what I was excited about is that the majority of people love the engagement, but at some point just say, okay, I'm ready to set an appointment. What, what can you share looking at the data recently? When we, see, when I thought digital retailing, I was like, hey, the consumer's really going to be able to go through most of this on their own. As we've been recording the videos of people shopping, that's not so much happening. So it almost feels like if you don't have integrated live interaction with your digital retailing tool, you could be missing the complete upside. What do you guys think? Yeah, so, um, you know, we're looking at each step in the funnel of digital retailing from, you know, entering in uh, to the process uh, via entry point on the, on the SVP or the VDP uh, all the way to the completion. Uh, obviously, there's, you know, drop-offs hap happening um, throughout that process. Um, some of the, the data that we can share is um, similar to, to Tim. We're seeing uh, similar numbers of, of uh, customers who are completing the process in the 3 to 4% uh, number. Um, there is a uh, large amount of consumers who aren't necessarily going all the way to submitting a full credit application. They're dropping off uh, somewhere in between um, and producing an extremely high-quality um, lead. I almost hesitate to call these things, to, to use the word lead anymore, because I feel like we're moving beyond lead uh, towards a deal. Um, in our platform, uh, you know, dealerships can proactively communicate with the, uh, with the consumer while they're in, in the digital retailing process to help them. I mean, you mentioned yesterday with the trims and how confusing the process can be sometimes. So, 
Um, you know, we're seeing uh, another, another number I can share that, that we're seeing is uh, an increase in uh, F&I gross uh, on the back end. Um, so deals that are coming through uh, digital retailing uh, in our platform are producing more F&I uh, than uh, a traditional uh, website lead or, or internet lead. And I think that the reason for that is the fatigue of you know, coming into the store and spending three hours in the store is no longer there because they're completing more of the process online. They're much fresher when they come into the store. They're spending less time, and when they um, when they're uh, you know being uh, not sold, but you know when they, when they're hitting the F and I office or, and being communicated with about those products, uh, they're much uh, in a in a much better state of mind to purchase. So, yeah. Um, we talked about subprime, Andrew, but you built a tool um, from the ground up. As you've been expanding out, how are you instructing, how is your software handling the subprime, you know, customer? Is there anything you can share for any dealers watching that, you know, there are some dealers that 50, over 50% of their business is subprime. Um, are all tools going to work? Or is this really a specialized piece that has to be, you know, carefully customized? Um, so I always, when I see a such uh, a question like that, I always look back to what do other industries do with digital retail and what do dealers do already? Because I think that we can always answer it that way. Um, when you sit there, no one looks at automotive and says, that is an awesome example of selling things online. Um, so if you look at that same example and you think about subprime in other verticals, um, there's oftentimes calls to action which will say contact us because this is a special situation. And that's the same thing that happens at dealers. Um, when you have, I mean, inside our store, um, we knew that depending upon um, who was floor planning with what banks or who knew what with relationships, there were different times where it's easier or it was, um, you had different levels of how easy it was to get something approved, depending upon which lender and which approval person you were talking to. So the fact that that even exists means that an online approval process that might deny someone might be different if you're in the store. Um, so I always think when you're when you're digitizing, when you're adding transparency, you should only be doing it when it's competitive. And if there's something that actually operates better in the store, you should get people in the store involved. Um, I, I think that that... Um, as we look at the problem of digital retail, if we just try to paint a picture and say um, the thing that we're chasing is just buy online and can we do everything online, then we're not answering the actual problem. Um, the actual problem is like, are we shopping the right way? Um, one of the examples that we use is uh, name anything else that you buy that's new by VIN or by serial number and like anything else. And when you think about it, there's not anything else. Everything else might be by model. You might be comparing things around. And you go to any dealer website. You go to any of, I mean, we're all, everyone up here is guilty of it too, where, you know, you're going for shopping for something new. You click on new inventory, and you just see every VIN that they have. Um, if we were inside a dealership, you'd never show someone a stock list when they said, I'm interested in a new car. Like, you'd talk them through a, a process where you'd ask them, like, what are you interested in? Why are you looking for a new car? And bring them through it. You know the process, how to sell it in the store. Why don't we do that online? Um, you think about Apple, and you look at when they're selling a new iPhone. You click on iPhone, you never see a list of all 3,500 iPhones that they have in the back warehouse. You see a list that's informing you of, like, the different models, helping you compare, and then helping you buy it. If they don't have one in stock, there's a little bubble. I think you talked about this yesterday, where there was a little bubble saying, we don't have that color, you know, um, back order two weeks. On a dealership website, it's not listed. Um, inside our store, we could always just locate the car if we didn't have it. So it's, it's bringing those dealership processes online that I think is the, the most important next step. So, so, Andrew, are you implying that the current website designs, as we move into digital retail, my experience with the trim, my experience with the Range Rover, the websites were really no help to me. And I, and I consider myself somewhat of a savvy buyer. Uh, does anybody want to pick up this conversation that maybe for digital retailing really works, we need to reinvent what a standard dealer website looks like instead? Hey, Alexi? 
Yeah, um, it's interesting. When we first started out, you know, we could see consumers wanting to everything, let's say, on social networks. Look at Facebook Marketplace. You can buy and pay for a pre owned vehicle using PayPal right now in Marketplace. You never have to go to dealer's website, right? Um, people have asked us, well, are you going to get in the website business? I'm like, the website business for us is dead. It's a necessary evil that is kind of out there. But the reason why so many of us have great technology companies is because the websites have stopped. So we've been able to enhance it with new tools and technology to do what really websites should. Um, the original Response Logics is actually a personalized website for every single lead. It's taking, and it came from a dealer, Toyota Sunnyville, Adam Sims. He's like, my website sucks. I can't get my website providers to integrate or do what I want, and it's not flexible. So he instead created microsites for every single consumer and lead that came in um, that were more flexible, more personal. So we do see that, that there's so many ways now consumers want to transact, and um, you have to accommodate them. A big stat that we look at is not the con- just the conversions. We look at that. You know, luckily, we plug in a DMS because of surveys, and we show you exactly what everything's making, all the leads that follow through us. But we look at the cost of what you're ignoring or what you're losing. It is shocking when you mystery shop and you think like a consumer. And one of the reasons why we got into the business of, like, AI and, and, and chat was so much drop-off came to really bad consumer experiences. There was another pain point. It's like, how can we help this? You know, you, you gave that dealer socket example. I think lead counts and sales would go up. Because if you're actually answering the questions, thinking like a consumer, not, oh, what's the first question you usually hear is, oh, in case you get disconnected, can I get your email? If I wanted to give you an email as a consumer, I wouldn't have started a chat, you know. So if you really think about the cost of ignoring what you're losing and almost reverse engineer it, now, still have websites. It's, you know, it's kind of like your, your, your shingle, you're saying, I'm in business, but it has to be more dynamic, for sure. I, I have to agree that, you know, the data that I look at for paid search by year, make, model, the typical Google playbook, and I've written about this and spoke about it, so for some of you it's a broken record, but it's worth repeating. What I can, what I can uh, average and estimate that when you buy year, make, and model and take them to a list of cars, as uh, Andrew was saying, which is here's all the VIN numbers, okay, 70% of the people never go to another page. Let me say that again. 70% of the people that you think are ready to speed date into a serial number list of cars don't look at a single VDP. They don't go anywhere else. They're like, whoa. Now, we know that some of that is because people click on ads that they shouldn't, and we know that some of that is because people click on your ads to get the phone number or the address. But that's a pretty startling result. I think it's an indication that we really need to thank our shopping. Andrew, you, you seem to be raising up out of your seat. What do you got to tell me? Come on. Um, Bring it on. Come on. So uh, you're talking with a SRP or VDP, and you look through and you look at the experience, and you get, um, you know, in our world, Civic LX, you know, Civic Sport, Accord EX, Accord Sport. Um, and you're looking at the difference, and they're going to be $2,000 different. And you still don't know the difference in equipment. Um, and that's like saying that someone, again, back to what do other verticals do? What do dealerships do already? That's like saying someone never walked in and didn't know the difference between two trims. Right? Like that happens all the time. So how are we educating people in these experiences to answer these questions? And at the end of the day, like as the, you know, I'm sure the, the website companies have a lot of challenges, right? There are great partners out there. A lot of it's how much you partner with them and work with them to answer some of these questions or set up the experience that you want to display your value to customers. Um, but that's one of the reasons why it's the dealership role is so imperative with digital retail today because it's not just about adding a buy online button and expecting that consumers are just going to go through it. They need to build that trust. They need to answer those questions. And digital retail today, from what we've seen from the dealers we're working with, is actually about um, helping the dealership answer those questions and making sure that it's fast and consistent and making sure that um, since it's so much easier to reach out when answering these questions, it's all right at their fingertips so anyone in the store can do it as well as a desk manager be able to do um, to maintain that process. Tim, I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, I have a prejudice. I believe, uh, after filming Consumers and Consumers, uh, the reason why only 3, 4, or 5% go through all the way uh, is because today's user interfaces are a little confusing, overwhelming. Uh, they've just never done it before. And so my prejudice is 
if a digital retailing solution doesn't have integrated live assistance, we're going to be missing a lot. To, you know, it's not field of dreams. You know, build it and he will come. Um, what I'm interested, uh, Tim, is is this concept of uh, live person has last year at the AES and this year referred to it, um, the Apple Business Chat. So stores like Lowe's and Home Depot, they're getting away from a website. I can text to Lowe's and say I need a 40-pound bag of bird seed. The right in the text, they're communicating with me, show to VDP, they send, push a link, I can pay for it. I never visited the website. Um, because it's bird seed. I know what bird seed is. Some of the dealers commented, well, yeah, Brian, I understand that consumers don't know how to do it and they need help, but all the people who provide chat support suck. So let me tell you, I'm going to put a tool on my website and someone's going to pop up and ask a question and they're going to make me look bad. I believe that the support is needed. What's the model that gives the consumer the expert Right? We saw that in one of the slides. They want to talk to an expert. How do we allow them to talk to an expert? My question, hey, which Honda model has leather seats and bucket, you know, and get a real answer. What's the solution? How are you working with dealers to give them the confidence that your chat team, your DR team, is qualified to be their DR partner? Well, I mean, that, that's in our, our very DNA when we, when we started uh, – are now in my dealership. Uh, we wanted to give a white glove experience to that consumer online and explain that. Um, Have you ever worn white gloves? Um, on Wednesday. Okay, great. I just want to know Wednesday, because I'm having a hard time visualizing you with white gloves. But well, go ahead. Please I, tell I, us. I, I do have a friend's cup sitting. Okay, but that's well, a whole other that's, subject. Well, that's for the breakout. Right. Okay, go ahead. No, but in our very DNA, when you, you know, Cardone said it years ago, it's information overload, right? When you give people more than they ask for, so we do, within our tool, have the ability to send that brochure, to send comparisons, so we have those answers. Now, buy now is, so, is, is strategically different when we set it up as far as the process than our, uh, a customer that's just using our chat or text or messaging platform. Now, we train them for the dealership personnel to answer those, and we strongly suggest that it's management, somebody that can jump in and make a deal. And it's very simply just, you know, letting them know that, hey, listen, this is Simcox and Felicia Lexus. Please take your time to our VIP service. We're here to serve you. And at the end of the day, every talk that anybody's ever hear, heard me do, um, I don't don't believe anything that I'm saying. You know, we, we look at the numbers. We have a 32% higher lead to close, period, end of the story. It's not up for debate. 32% higher lead to close, and customers have a conversation with an expert. So the... The data in, in our own source. That's right. That's so, so when someone has a conversation, that that a number of leads generated. So it's showing us, right, that in order for digital retail to really work, we need assistance. Brian, how is Gubagoo rethinking uh, how much your team should be doing online and when to pass off to the dealer? How's that handoff? Because I was talking to you and Brad, and it was very interesting that some progressive dealers were really uh, buying into the online assistance. Can we can we talk about that uh, that tango between an outsourced initial conversation? Uh, somebody's going through they they've done some things, and your agent saying, "Man, this is a hot this this looks like a uh, a good person." How can you signal the store that I have a real deal being built so a sales manager could jump in? Sure. So we believe that this, uh, we believe that messaging is core to producing positive outcomes for both consumer and the dealer within digital retailing, as I mentioned before. Um, now, uh, that being the case, uh, we recognize that the dealer is not always going to be available to help the consumer uh, with questions through the process. Uh, how does the process work? Is this a real trade value? Is this guaranteed? Things like that. So what we do is we staff a dedicated team of specialists who are hyper-trained and only handling inquiries uh, of this nature on digital retailing. Um, at the same time, we, we don't want to make the decision 
we don't want a human making the decision of when to make that chat available to the dealership. We want the dealership to get involved and we want to notify them as soon as possible that a customer is building a deal on their website, just like they would want to be notified if a customer was on the lot or in the store, um, you know, getting into the front seat of a vehicle and smelling the leather. Um, so what we do is when that deal starts, we fire notifications uh, via our web app uh, on desktop as well as our mobile app that a deal is started. And we train the, the dealer to, um, you know, use certain conditions and rules to decide uh, whether to jump in or proactively reach out to the consumer because they can do that as well. But we feel that that and the training that goes into that is extremely important. So when, when we enable a dealer and implement them on, on Goo Goo Virtual Retailing, we are making sure that um, the BDC or whomever, the internet manage, uh, manager or whomever is uh, responsible for, um, you know, working with those online customers who are building deals are fully enabled and able to, um, you know, communicate with the customer. And we do have uh, some dealers that are extremely active that are seeing, uh, those are actually the dealers that are having the best results by far are the ones who are taking an active role in communicating with the customer while they're in the digital retailing process, building trust while the customer's uh, on the site, just like they were in the showroom. And that kind of really supports, you know, my conversation on Monday morning about how horrible our current call to action buttons are to popping up a form to, to really how broken that is. And, and I challenged everyone uh, in the uh, conference and online to really think about working with partners that can provide that online engagement, moving CTA button forms to CTA button engagement. Um, Kelly, I want to ask you a question. Cox is a massive influence in the auto industry. Um, you own key properties and key pieces of technology. What I haven't heard from anybody on this conference is attribution models in DR. So you know, uh, and I, I'm sure all your sites are pixels, so Auto Trader, KBB, um, the dealership, uh, dealer.com websites. You have uh, the ability to pixel track VIN solutions emails. Um, are you ready to talk about, show, or demonstrate to a dealer that when we start talking about attribution, like we're going to do more in November, that uh, when a DR record comes in, your ecosystem could be fairly represented by saying, this person did some work on KBB, this person did some work on AutoTrader, they came to your website. When this lead comes in to Vin Solutions, it's just not a DR lead from their website, but it actually shows influence or shopping behavior on other Cox properties. Uh, great question. So we, we've done a, a lot of analysis uh, where the greatest volume of traffic and engagement uh, has been for a long period of time, and that's the attribution model around digital retailing for uh, dealer websites and then in-store activity. Um, and so we, we have sort of a body of, of data science research there. In addition to that, we have actually quite a lot of research on marketing attribution running across KBB, AutoTrader, and, and Dealer.com. But what, what we see, we'll be adding, you know, we, we kind of, we have digital retailing on AutoTrader now and KBB. We're getting a lot of volume and a lot of installs there. Uh, so we'll be adding uh, a perspective on AutoTrader as, as well. Um, but generally speaking, what we're, what we're seeing now is, and it, it's similar to, to what the dealers talked about this morning on, and some of the panelists here, um, we absolutely see um, higher higher leads, and again, this is a lot, of, a lot of folks are still very focused on leads. So when digital retailing is present, we absolutely see an aggregate lift in leads. Um, and so uh, it's like two and a half times the, the number of, of leads that ultimately you get. And that can be simply because you've engaged them, uh, a consumer online, and they may not necessarily go all the way through the process. Uh, they may choose to pick up the phone. They may start a chat. They may fill out some other lead form. Uh, so we actually see that. We can see it, you know, we can also analyze today relative to other 
ways to source kind of customer engagement or, or customer leads in the store. Digital retailing is a much more high-performing way to engage a consumer. It, they, they close more prevalently. They have higher profitability. Um, so, so tons of traffic today, uh, you know, through dealer.com that, that gives us that data. Um, and, and we'll just be getting getting more analysis done as we go forward with, uh, with AutoTrader. All right, I'm going to start with a minute as we get ready to just open up uh, for some questions. The popcorn is being served. That's because the movies are about to start. All the little details of a conference are very important. Right, Gino? Popcorn, good? Excellent, good. All right, um, I need a short answer from each of you, so try to keep it short. Would you be so transparent as to tell me what you think the largest roadblock is today for digital retailing success from your perspective, whether it's, hey, APIs suck, or, the, you know, uh, dealers are confused, or OEMs, whatever it is, would you say if there was one thing that you wish could be resolved quickly so um, a modern retail experience could really flourish in a more, uh, you know, bigger way across the U.S., what's one big roadblock of it? Yeah, I think right now it's noise in this space. I think it's such a sexy part of the business, quote unquote, and the new panacea that it's just getting overly noisy. And I think dealers are starting to get ridiculously confused as to who actually does what to what level of value. But the more we simplify this thing, I think the better off everyone's going to be. Great, Andrew. Um, I think it, it's about it's there's not enough focus on the customer and the customer behaviors, and actually making sure that they're their experience online matches what the best in other industries does, and that we enable dealerships to be able to service them seamlessly um, with consistent data. We'd expect it from every other industry, but um, it doesn't happen here. Um, quick two-part answer. One, I'm hearing from dealers that there's too many tools and too many that are archaic that don't work, so their people are spending too much time plugged in literally like an umbilical cord to all of these boxes instead of doing what they should now, which is freeing themselves up from that, automating more, um, so they could just be people with other humans. Because, you know, consumers still want that at the point they want it. Second, DMS. And a lot of these, you know, older systems that have, you know, forced us into a path that doesn't necessarily work today in terms of how consumers want to handle their own process. You know, I love the VIN example. I mean, it's crazy, but some of those those providers today just, I mean, they're, you know, decades behind in terms of being able to support. And then the OEMs requiring that you're still plugged into them. So. Well, actually, that's the first time I've ever heard anybody complain about a DMS. Um, obviously. Uh, it's still there. Oh, yeah. it, Kelly, um, looking out at the landscape, if you had a crystal ball, magic wand, What's one thing that's really preventing more widespread adoption of a modern retail experience? I, I think that we have to, as an industry, relook at the sales process in store. Um, to be effective in digital retailing, you can be effective in a variety of different ways. I think you can have a different strategy, uh, but you cannot look at this as just take what I do in the store today and shove it up online and hope it all works out. The rest of it is all just ones and zeros, people. It's technology, it's systems, it's work, it's a little bit of time. But if we as an industry can't reimagine our sales process, um, we'll be stuck where we are forever. Right? Yeah, I mean, I'd actually uh, echo what Kelly's saying. I are you co mean copying her answer? Yeah, well, she, she happened to be going before me, oh, unfortunately. Okay, good. I mean, I could say the traditional things like, you know, data, being able to... Uh, push into desking, be able to communicate effectively with CRMs and, and, and DMS, but I really do truly think that it's a change in mindset at the dealership level and uh, buy-in and the understanding of why these changes are happening at, at, the, at the dealership level. I mean, this is an entrenched really way of selling that you know, dealers have been selling for for a long time, so it takes time to for these changes to happen. And I would also say that, you know, I don't think it's being blocked right now. I think that we're very early. And these these changes, this is a fundamental change in the way that cars are sold, um, take time and, and we're early. And I think that uh, as long as there's 
a willingness to change at all levels of the industry, whether it's dealerships, whether it's uh, data partners, whether it's uh, vendors, um, I believe that we'll continue to push forward. Tim? I pulled this up so I get these numbers correct. Go ahead. Um, I don't know if anybody saw last month in automotive news. You know, I think we're past, uh, you know, we study data and all of us have companies, we study data. We need to study what consumers are telling us. Uh, number one used car retailer in the country is CarMax with 721,000 cars. I was one of those dealers that used to laugh at CarMax 15 years ago and sell my wholesale and when they used to take that. And oh, by the way, they're $1,200 higher PBR than every franchise dealer on average in the country. And the newcomers, uh, Carvana, sold 94,108 cars. That's higher than Asbury and higher than Larry H. Miller, and they were 149 short of being number seven with selling more cars than Hendrick. We as dealers, we as a community have got to understand in 2019, we are no longer in the car business, we are in the people business. And people, if you, Carvana, if you ask every one of these 94,000 people, did they buy their car online? They're going to say, absolutely we did. We know they didn't. They're selling the experience. We've got to treat people that way and understand that this is a people business and not a car business. Great. I'd like to open up uh, the floor uh, to anyone who has a question for our panelists. Let me take uh, Ryan's mic and Paul. Not only will you ask the question, uh, you're going to be my manservant for the next five minutes. There we go. Um, so you have an inside look across a broad spectrum of people adopting digital retailing. In your opinion, what do you, how do you see the growth curve playing out? Um, where do you think we reach kind of mass adoption within the industry? How long from now? Great question. So I'll just share some of some of our our research. So um, it depends on mass adoption of what, obviously, but. Um, so, so we periodically kind of segment consumers and try to understand, you know, who are the right consumer targets that are, are right for, for a digital retailing type of experience, whether that's just a single step or kind of doing the whole thing. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, 60% of the, of the consumer market right now would categorically say they would like to do multiple steps of the deal online but don't actually feel like they have to, you know, we get all excited sometimes about online contract signing and stuff like that, right? But it, that's, I think that's, that's far less important than ultimately being able to either have the car delivered and, or, or show up quickly. Um, on the flip side, when we look at the segmentation of the dealer market, um, about half of the dealer market is, is our late adopters of technology. Um, and so, and the other half have varying strategies of adoption. Um, uh, uh, so, you know, from, from, hey, I'm still kind of very focused on lead gen to I'm, I'm really, I'm trying to actually kind of drive towards relationship building and transparency, or in some cases, and I think this is probably true of, of a lot of retailers of used cars, they're really trying to drive as much of the process online because it's much more efficient for them. Um, but uh, when I, when we roughly look at how many dealers uh, have some type of a digital retailing solution, it's actually quite small. It's probably, I'd probably estimate, you know, don't kill me if I get this completely wrong, we're redoing the numbers now, it's about a third of the market is doing something in digital retailing. So we're a long, long way from actually really saying that we've got, you know, we've got quote unquote mass adoption of somebody executing some type of a strategy beyond kind of lead generation. Um, but, you know, like, like a lot of change, I think that, I think as people over, they, they hear data, they hear data that we are sharing as, you know, as, as software providers and, and partners in the marketplace, or they hear other uh, dealers talk about this, um, if, if people can get over this concern that somehow they'll have less profitable deals, um, uh, you know, some of the other objections are, I want to provide a high-touch experience, uh, but they really hear positive results, I think, from uh, engaging the customer where they want to be engaged, I think that those numbers will start to change, and I think that they will start to change quickly. Part of the accelerator here is that, you know, I mean, look, the market is shifting, right? So um, you're going to have to be a lot more effective at selling used cars. Uh, it'll be very challenging kind of to, to defend and increase your market share in new cars. Um, you have to meet the customers where they are. And I think the numbers will play it out and people will, will change and they'll change, start to change more quickly. And, and Paul, let me just add something from my perspective. 
Um, we've been learning a lot, Len and I, as we've been working with Travis on the road. I think uh, there's a there's another hold hold back. If the right foundation isn't in place, I think we're going to see dealers spinning DR tools every six to nine months like they do Edwards. Uh, the average dealer, we estimate that every 15 months changes their Edwards provider, and, and every time it doesn't get any better. Uh, without the right foundation, I think we could run into this just turnstile of another technology. So um, with the proper foundation, I think we'd accelerate. If we don't understand the proper foundation, I think we're going to spin. One more question before we go to the movies. Question from the floor. Everyone. Oh, go ahead, Andy. I wonder if somebody else is going to ask. Um, this was just thinking, what percentage or, or how many of the people that are on these different different programs are inserting their brand messaging into this solution versus just uh, plugging in and after the fact? So, like, uh, inserting videos, uh, yeah. personal stuff, or just going out of the box? Okay, that's a good question. Who wants to answer that? Oh, on microphone. I might be more than seen in that and didn't realize what a big impact uh, that that makes um, as far as we have some dealers that, you know, when they click on the button, there's a, like a tutorial video or a brand experience um, that they advertise what they're getting ready to go through, and we've seen a lot uh, a lot better results. I don't have, I'm not going to make that statistic right now, but uh, but we're seeing more and more and actually uh, put together a video production crew to help them with that to generalize videos. And I think uh, going through the field with people, I've seen some, some, some good some good content from them, too, as far as uh, video. You know, Andy, when we tested the digital retailing at the Automotive Analytics and Attribution Summit at number, uh, November, that was one of the key takeaways, that consumers were stuck. They didn't really understand certain things. Um, like, for example, if I asked Terry, you know, what gap coverage is, I don't think she would know, right? I don't think Connor would know what gap coverage is, you know what I mean? Or should they? Yeah, or, or should they? But I'm, I'm just saying that was one of the observations. And since then, because everyone listens to what I say and what the conferences say, I mean, we've seen that big move towards customization, and that's a big plus. Paul, did you want to say something? You go to Carvana's website and go through the process if you haven't. They do a great job at video. If you get stuck, watch a video. It explains what you're about to go through. Great. Would you give our panel a big round of applause? Come on down. All right, you guys can sit down. Hi, this is Brian Pash, founder of PCG Companies, and I'm glad that you enjoyed some of the excerpts from the Digital Marketing Strategies Conference in the beautiful Napa Valley. Coming up in November is the Automotive Analytics and Attribution Summit. It's in beautiful Palm Beach, Florida. It's November 17th, 18th, and 19th. I encourage you to go to the website, Automotive Attribution Summit, and purchase your tickets. Last year, we sold out. This conference is available to dealers, OEMs, and automotive industry leaders on the vendor side, developer side, or analyst side of the business. Remember, we have a special rate at the Breakers Hotel, and it's important that you book early because we have a limited block of rooms, and since so many of the activities are happening at the Breakers, you wouldn't want to miss staying at the hotel and being able to conveniently attend the cocktail receptions, the workshops, the keynotes, and the special events. Keep in mind that those of you who'd like to come a day early, we have a full day Google Analytics certification class. And for the first time this year, for data-driven automotive professionals, we're going to have some specific training on Google Tag Manager and Google Data Studios. So make sure that you make your reservations for both your tickets and your hotel as soon as possible.